Hey, good morning, everyone. Jess here. Great to be with you. Before we read the text, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 7. We're actually going to conclude it this morning. I want to pray for our time this morning. So if you can join me in a word of prayer, that would be great. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you are true. You are perfect in all of your ways, and you are worthy of all praise. Lord, thank you that we can be with you at any moment of the day. Thank you, Lord, that we can go to you at, Lord, of any time of the day. And, Lord, that you're listening, that you're hearing us. Thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord, that you've given us. Oh, Lord, thank you for your precious word. God, would again the Spirit of God take the Word of God and transform us, the children of God, into your image. So, Father, speak to us, teach us, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So, if you can, go with me to Matthew 7. I'm going to start in verse 13. We're going to read all the way down to 29 this morning. Jesus says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, By their fruits you will know them, Jesus says. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name. Oh, Lord, have we not done many wonders in your name? And then... Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And other translations say, go away, you who practice lawlessness. And therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall. For it was founded, here it is, on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings. The people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. So, this morning we are here, we're going to look at the conclusion of Jesus' marvelous sermon on the mount. Just like Pastor Roger said in the beginning, one of the most greatest well-known sermons ever to be taught. We're at the end of it today. Months ago, we started looking into Jesus' sermon, Matthew chapter 5. That's where it starts. And this is where Jesus is teaching his disciples and all those who are listening the way to true happiness is how he opens it up. He's teaching them the attitudes of a citizen for his kingdom. But now here in chapter 7, he wraps up his sermon by teaching to his Again, disciples are there, his listeners, that they must decide about coming a citizen of his kingdom or remain a citizen of this fallen world and receive eternal condemnation and everlasting punishment, which I pray that 
No man chooses that way. But the question I have given for us to think about, which way, which one are you going to choose? Now, would you agree that there are a lot of decisions in life? If you're a father, mother, individual, student, just a person living here on earth, there are a lot of decisions that come our way. What to wear, what to eat, where to go, what to do, what should I say, where are you, or who are you going to marry, what career are you going to follow, and it goes on and on. But I believe the most important decision in life that you and I are going to make is this very one. What are you going to do about the person of Jesus Christ? That is, I believe, the most important decision that every human being has to face and has to choose to decide to do. What are you going to do about Jesus Christ? Why? Because that decision alone determines your eternal destiny. It is the decision that Jesus calls for all men and all women to make. This choice of going two ways is not new. God has always allowed men and women to choose him or not. He's pleaded with man to choose him. He's always provided and given a reason why to choose Jesus. But he always again leaves it up to us. For example, Israel. When they were wandering in the wilderness, the Lord instructed Moses to tell the people, I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life, Moses said, in order that you may live. After Israel came out of the wilderness into the promised land, Joshua confronted them again with a choice. He said, Continue serving the Egyptian and the Canaanite gods, the ones that you've adopted and turned to, or turn to the Lord who has delivered you from Egypt and who has given you the promised land. Joshua said, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. On the Mount of Carmel, the prophet Elijah asked the people of Israel, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the Lord commanded Jeremiah to set a choice for Israel again. He says, thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life or the way of death. And then lastly, Jesus calls his disciples and after, you know, some of his ministry, in his days of his ministry here on earth, so many would listen, consider, but a lot would uh, leave. And he came to his 12 disciples after so many left Jesus one day and says, Disciples, what are you going to do? Are you going to be like them that will leave? And then Peter says this so wonderfully. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life. You are the Holy One of God. So again, this call that he's making for us is not new. He's been commanding us and giving us to make a, a choice from the very beginning days of the Garden of Adam and Eve after the fall. And so this morning in our text, verse 13 through 29, Jesus gives us four contrasting images to help us understand these two ways. Number one, verse 13 through 14, he gives two gates. Number two, in verse 15 through 20, he gives two trees. Number three, verse 21 through 23, he gives two claims, which we're going to briefly talk about because Joel Carter spoke on that a few weeks ago. And then fourthly, verse 24 through 27, he gives us two builders. So, two gates, two trees, two claims, two builders. And each contrast, this is what I want to make clear. It's not the choice between religion or irreligion. It's not the choice between a higher religion or a lower one. It's not the choice between nice people or vile people. The contrast is between God's righteousness 
and human's righteousness. It's between God's revelation and human's religion. It's between trusting God simply and then or trusting self. And the choice that you or I choose, it leads to either everlasting life, Jesus says, or eternal punishment in hell. So, big choices with big results. And so I want to do my best this morning to help you better understand these contrasts. Let's start with the first of the four. Number one, the two gates. Verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate. What does Jesus mean What he says? Enter by the narrow gate. Well, first, we need to understand that these verse, or this verse, treats the gate and the way alike. In other words, the gate and the way work together. Whether you think of them as a gate to be entered or a way to be pursued, the important point is that you make sure you enter the gate or travel on the road that leads to life. That's what's important. The second thing you need to understand in this first section the way that leads to life is the difficult way it's not easy and jesus says a few find it god's way of salvation is remarkably easy or i'm sorry simple but it's not easy the way is not easy why is the narrow way difficult well number one we can't give nothing Or we can't pay anything to earn us interest or entrance to the kingdom of heaven. And I say that because so many people try to do that. That's kind of our nature before we become born again. We want to work our way to heaven. We want to earn our way to get there. And Jesus says, a few find it. A few find it that way. Number two, Jesus teaches because it is the way of self-denial and the cross, few find it. That's why it's so difficult. Jesus says, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. The cross, the cross is um, it's crucifixion, it's death. It's that picture of, of killing the old man. That we don't go back to it. We leave that old nature, that old man behind. And again, as Christ was risen, we are risen with new life. The person who says yes to Christ must say no to the things of the world. Because you are in Christ, you are now relying on His power rather than your own. Because now you have chosen Christ, you are relying on His righteousness rather than your own. And because you're in Christ... You're willing to forsake your own way and choose his way. Following Christ can bring persecution. That's why it's difficult. Following Christ brings ridicule, tribulation. Jesus says you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, he says. So when we identify ourselves with Jesus, boy, we declare war on the devil. He hates it. And he declares war on us. The one whom you and I formerly served now becomes our enemy. And the ideas and the ways we once held dear now become our great temptations and pitfalls. It's not the popular way, the narrow gate. It's not the one that the crowds are flocking to. For Jesus says, few find it. So why then? Here's the question. Why then does he say here, many go the broad way, the easy way? Well, it's attractive. The broad way is the broad-minded way. The broad way is the way where sins are tolerated, where truth is moderated, and where humility is ignored. It's the way where God's word is praised but not studied. It's the way his standards are admired, but they're not followed. It's the way where you invent your own beliefs, your own behavior. 
It's the way you live your own by your own standards. It's the way requires no spiritual maturity, no moral character, no commitment, no sacrifice. That's why it's so easy. It's the way of floating downstream, but what's so often missed is that that way downstream leads to death. Perhaps some of you are saying, wow, Jess, I don't want to go that way. I'd rather go the difficult way. And you can. You can choose that today. So, how does one enter the narrow gate? Number one, you recognize, the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, you recognize you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Trust in Jesus, His finished work on the cross for your sin. And then the Bible says, turn from your sin. Surrender your life, love Him, and serve Him with all your heart. Number two, you enter the narrow gate by your own choosing. You don't do it because your granddaddy or grandmama did it. You don't do it because your parents do it. But you do it because it's your choice. Number three, you enter the narrow gate taking, here it is, and I think this is one of the hardest, taking nothing with you, not anything of your old life. The gate is narrow. You can't fit that big bag of the old nature with you. You can't keep anger, bitterness, greed, covetousness, and all that kind of stuff. You leave it at the cross. You leave it at the cross. No bringing it with you. Give it to Jesus Christ. And here's another one that I think so often we don't think of. You have to leave your, I'll say your associates behind. Mm -hmm. Friendships that, well, at one time they were dear, but a lot of those friendships abused me, used me, threw me to the corner. But now Jesus, as you enter a relationship with him, you have a whole new life. You have a whole new family. That's, it's entering the family of God. Now, I'm not saying to leave them or we could, we could still love them, minister to them, but we are now in fellowship with a, a new family, God's family, Jesus' family. And you don't bring them with you. The verse I love in the, the hymn, it says, Even though none go with me, still I will follow. So the question is, is there anything today keeping you from following Jesus Christ? Christian, if you are a believer listening today, is there anything hindering you from fully following Jesus? Is fear maybe in the way, pride, career, Things of the world hindering you from following Jesus fully. He wants a whole heart, not a half heart, whole heart. Even though Christ said, though, his path is difficult, the truth is it's a blessed life. That's why he started in Matthew 5. Blessed are those, happy are those who are poor in spirit. It is a blessed life. It may be a hard life, but it's a life of help. It's a life of of rest. It's a life of peace. Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary, who are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. My friends, it is the best way. The best way. The second contrast Jesus gives, verse 15 through 20, two trees. So we've talked about two gates. Now he talks about two trees and their fruit, the fruit they produce. So in this section, I want to just kind of give some understanding to it. He compares and takes teachers in the church and makes them uh, trees. One's a good tree, one's a bad tree. He said, the good tree produces good fruit, simply, and the bad tree produces bad fruit. And with these trees, they each have a destination. One tree enters heaven, think of a life. And the other tree, a life, enters hell. It's the same flow, the same kind of result in each of these sections. So he helps us understand what is a um, false way of living and then a true way of living by taking a false teacher. In verse uh, 15, he says, Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. I want to ask, who are these false prophets? And 
Do they still exist today? Yes, they do. They've been existing ever since the, re, the redemptive time of history when after Adam and Eve fell. As long as God had true prophets, Satan had false ones. Paul warned us about these uh, false prophets in Romans 16. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teachings which you've learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not to our Lord Jesus Christ, but to their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattery speech, they deceive hearts of the unsuspecting. Verse 15, Jesus says, beware of these. The word beware. Here, here's what I want you to understand. Beware, Jesus says, conveys the idea, this is my point, of holding the mind away. You see that? Beware conveys the idea of holding your mind away from them. False teachers are dangerous and we should not expose, here it is, your minds to them. Why? Because they pervert thinking. They're poison to our soul. They're, they're more dangerous than cobras or tigers. Cobras and tigers will, can destroy our body but false teachers are like spiritual beasts who poison and destroy our souls. That's why they're so deadly. Peter goes on to warn us that they deceive unstable souls, luring them into their jaws through the lust of their flesh. Man, I'm telling you, these are some serious words. Jesus says, they come to you. That's interesting. He says, be aware of false prophets who come to you. You don't have to go to them. They will come to you. If you've ever been at maybe Saturday, sitting in your living room, you hear a, a knock on the door. And some would say, I'm the Church of the Latter-day Saints. We're part of the Mormon family. Christian science. Those are just some that the Bible declares that are, are false prophets. Beware of them. They come to you. And they come to you in sheep's clothings, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. So they actually can come into the church. They look like a sheep. They smell like a sheep. But inside, they're ravenous wolves. And they're, they're out to destroy the helpless sheep. They're merciless and they're ferocious. The word ravenous translates the swindler. Isn't that interesting? meaning or referring to those who deceitfully ravage a person of his money and his possessions. They are clever and they're always on the lookout for new victims. And so how do we as believers, and just how do we respond to these guys if they're ravenous, ferocious, swindlers? How, how do we handle these people? Well, Jude, read Jude, the book of Jude. It's at the end of the Bible, near Revelation. Jude says, keep yourselves first in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Meaning this, that first we need to take care of, strengthen ourselves in the Lord. We need to make sure we're in a place of fellowship, blessing, power, so we can be prepared. And that's the key word, to be prepared to have mercy on, I'm going to say, some. And why I say some? Because some of these false prophets are some that you don't want to give and cast your pearls out. I've faced some of these. But there are some in, and maybe they're, they're doubting, they're not confirmed in the false religion, and they're, they're actually seeking truth. I've, I've actually met some of these people. And God might be drawing them into himself. Well, I encourage you to pray and then witness to them with special care. But here's the key. Depend on the Lord for wisdom. And here's the key, protection. Ask the Lord for protection, lest you become spiritually contaminated by their polluted views and ways. That's the danger of them. So how do you determine and detect false prophets? Well, Jesus says here, you will know them by their fruits. Simple as that. You will know them by their 
fruits. What does that mean? Well, number one, you evaluate, or I'm sorry, not evaluate, you examine their character. Observe their inner motives, their standards. Examine their loyalties. Examine their attitude. Examine their ambitions. Peter tells us that the true teacher or Christian, the believer, will be growing in faith, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, brotherly kindness, and love. Peter says if these qualities are yours and you're increasing in them, he says this in 2 Peter. He says, they render you neither useless or unfruitfulness, meaning that you're growing, that you will produce fruit. On the other hand, those who are false Christians speak out arrogant words of vanity. They entice you by fleshly desires. They themselves are slaves of corruption, 2 Peter says. Their motives are of money, prestige, recognition, popularity, power, sexual looseness, and selfishness. If you want to know and test a true character of someone, are they and do they and practice the Beatitudes? That's kind of how Matthew chapter 5, Jesus opens up. These are the attitudes, the characteristics of a believer. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn over their sin, those who are meek, those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful, those uh, who are peacemakers. What a list. What a list Jesus gives us. The second way of knowing them is by their teaching. Know and listen to what they teach. It may seem actually biblical, But many times, if you carefully examine their teaching, their ideas are very unscriptural and their truth will be omitted. Third way of knowing them by their fruits is actually by their followers. By their followers. You will know um, them by their followers. They will attract people to themselves with the same superficial, unscriptural, self-indulgent orientation while being religious. So the question is in this text, which tree are you? A tree that is of the kingdom of God or a tree that remains in this world? One that bears good fruit or one that bears bad fruit? And again, the destinations have two different locations. One is heaven and one is eternal punishment in hell. Jesus is saying, choose. Everyone has to choose. The third contrast Jesus gives is two claims. Again, Joel Carter did a fabulous job teaching this text, what, a few weeks ago, verse 21 through 23. But I do want to just give a few things for us to think about in this text. I want us to think about why people fall into self-deception, meaning in this text... Many said to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, cast demons, done wonders in your names? And then Jesus says, I never knew you. They were self-deceived. So what allows, what causes the self-deception for people? Number one, they hold on to, here it is, false doctrines of assurance. What's that mean? Well, people think making a profession of faith Walking down an aisle, raising a hand, even singing a song will allow them to be in the kingdom of heaven. But that does not assure one. It's only by the true work of the Spirit in someone that can save, change, and seal a person for the kingdom of God. A pastor can't assure someone. But it's only by the Spirit of God. He is the witness for those who truly belong to God. Number two, self-deception comes when you fail to examine, self-examine yourself. Jesus, or I'm sorry, Paul says in Corinthians that the Lord tells his people to examine their lives. Why examine our lives? Well, because that examination looks at the heart, our motives, desires, motives, to see if they are actually set towards God's holiness and God's glory, or are they for ourselves? Number three, self-deception comes from concentration on religious activity. What does that mean? It means this, that 
You can again attend, you can hear, you can sing, you can cast out demons, you can prophesy, you can heal. You can do wonders in God's name. This is what blows my mind. But you still, with all that, still cannot know God. The fourth cause of deception. I call it, or many call it, a fair exchange. What does that mean? It means when I rationalize, or someone rationalizes your salvation by thinking that all the good things I have done will blot out the bad things I've done. It means that you take all your positive to cancel the negative. But the truth is, apart from God, it's impossible to do anything good. That's the truth. So, two claims. Two gates, two trees, two claims. And here's where I want to end the last one. The fourth contrast he gives, 24 through 27, the verses, he says, two builders. A couple things I want you to know about the builders. First, he says, these builders have heard the gospel. Each one of these, whether they hear or not, they've heard the gospel. We've learned this in Romans last week, that God gives everyone a chance to hear, to see, and to understand. But we all come to the point, do we either suppress that truth or do we receive that truth? And so both of these builders hear, both of the builders, again, then build their lives after they've heard the way of salvation. The contrast is the wise man builds his house, or the house is the the picture of life. The wise man builds his life on the rock. The rock is Jesus and his words. This builder is not one who only hears Jesus' words, but acts upon them, obeying his word. This is the mark of true discipleship. It's not simply hearing or believing, but it's doing the word of God. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, John says. The foolish man hears God's word and does not act upon them. This is building on the sand. What is the sand? Well, the sand is human opinions. You build your life on Human opinions, human attitudes, human wills, and all those human things, they always shift and change. They're not like a rock of Jesus Christ. The person that builds his house on the sand is unteachable. They always are learning, Timothy says, but never are able to come to the knowledge of the truth, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Ultimately, To build your life on the sand is to follow deception of Satan. And the most tragic difference between these builders is their final destination. The storms, which he says here, the rain, the floods, the winds, it represents and refers to the test that every human being will face, meaning God's judgment. God's judgment. You see, a life is not merely a matter of finding something that will get you through life. Rather, it is a matter of finding the person who can save you in your life. So at the final judgment day, which we'll all face one day, you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of your master. And not hearing, I never knew you. And being carried off to hell by God's verdict and command. So, there is a right way. And you have to choose. Have you committed your life and your future to Christ? I think you should if you have not done that yet. Most people, and here's the thing, most people watch, they'll listen, they'll consider Jesus, but they'll never put their faith and trust in Him. Look at even this. And so it was... When Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. It doesn't even say that they were saved. They were amazed by their teaching, for he taught with authority. We know in the Gospels that after teaching and doing miracles, people left. It was just him and his disciples. So that's what Jesus is getting at. The way of life. 
the narrow gate is difficult. The broad way is easy. Many choose the easy way. There's only a few that find eternal life. So, have you chosen? Don't let the hour of salvation pass. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you of your sin and begin following him with all your heart. Build your life on Jesus' words for they will save you both now and for eternity. It's time to decide and I want to pray now for us in our time. So Father in heaven, thank you for this text. Thank you for this truth. Holy Spirit, you being the great teacher, convictor, the comforter, the helper, I pray, Lord, that you would begin to just minister, speak to the hearts of those that are listening this morning. Lord, and I pray wherever the person's at, if they have not chosen you, Lord, I pray that they would choose you, that they'd be like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. And so when we face you in judgment day, Lord. Our lives will be tested, but we will have your son's righteousness, not our own. So Lord, I pray today people would choose you, your righteousness, your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you need prayer or have questions about God's word, and you'd like to know more about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can email me anytime. It's jess at coastlinelife.com. I would love to talk to you more about these things. So God bless you, and we'll see you next week.